I was scraping a living working as a security guard. I was stationed in shopping malls where my days were spent asking teenagers to move on. I sat behind desks in the lobbies of office blocks staring at CCTV monitors where nothing happened for hour after hour. And I patrolled construction sites on freezing cold nights, actually wishing that somebody would try and break in and steal some of the building materials. At least then, I could get warmed up by chasing them. My job was garbage. One night, I was responding to an alarm which had gone off at a lot of a car dealership. I parked up outside. The alarm was flashing, but there was no sign of damage to the building, so I assumed it was yet another waste of time. I stood in front of the window and looked at the sleek, high-performance vehicles on display that cost more than I would earn in a lifetime of my pathetic wage. My reflection peered back at me, a sad figure dressed in a gray security guard's uniform. I sighed, turned away, and headed back to my car. I had left my work phone on the passenger seat. I had to use it to fill in an online form after every call out before leaving the scene, and I would get my wages docked if I did not complete all the boxes correctly. I felt so futile. I unlocked the car and was reaching for the door handle when I saw movement across the road. A glimpse of something running on all fours. I slipped down an alley and away out of sight. I thought at first that it might have been a fox. There were a small number of exclusive restaurants in the surrounding blocks and their refuse would be packed with tasty morsels for scavengers. They wouldn't care that it was leftovers from hot cuisine prepared by a chef with his own show on cable TV. But my hand hovered over the door handle. What if it had been a dog, I wondered. A stray destined for the pile that would eventually heartbreakingly be put to sleep. I had always liked dogs a lot. I admired their loyalty and their tenacity. Though my circumstances over the years had meant that I had not owned one since I was a teenager. And though I should have got busy filling in the mind-numbing online form, I decided that I could wait. I wanted to see if it was a dog. If it was, maybe I could rescue it and give it a home. That would give my empty life some kind of purpose. And try not to think about how I was going to afford to pay for dog food and veterinarian's bills. I set off on the animal's trail. The alley that I had entered was narrow and dark. I gave my eyes a moment to adjust and then I carried on. I moved slowly, not wanting to spook the animal. I knew that if it felt threatened, it could lash out. And the last thing that I needed was a trip to the ER to get treated for a bite. But there was no sign of it, and the only sound was a drunk singing in the distance. I shook my head sadly. I would have to give up and get back to the car. There would be another job lined up for me by now, and the supervisor would be wondering where I was at. I turned, but did not take another step. A pair of eyes glowed in the darkness ahead of me. They were red and burning with rage. I could see the snout of the animal now as well and its teeth, only they were not the teeth of any kind of dog or fox. They were way too big and way too sharp. They were fangs, and they were coming my way. My guts cramped with fear. I needed to get out of there or stand and fight. I clenched my fist. The animal was close and it began to snarl and crouch. I realized with horror that it was about to go for me. Suddenly the alley was filled with the sound of screeching tires and an engine roaring like it was fit to burst. A car sped into view. It was backing in and barely fit into the cramped space. Its sides scraped along the sides of the alley with a sickening screech, and then it slammed to a halt. I heard a door open and a man stepped out of the driver's seat. He wore a battered leather coat that reached almost to his ankles. A fedora was balanced at a rackish angle on his head. He smiled and I saw a glint of a gold tooth. Well howdy, he said it to me. 
I'll take it from here. The animal had not moved since he had arrived in the scene. It had remained low to the ground, its teeth bared, its hackles raised. The man stood tall before it, patted a holster on his hip and said, I got six silver pieces in here. I'm only going to need one. There will be no mourning after regrets then. The only thing waiting for you will be a cold, hard grave. It was insane. He was speaking to a crazed animal as if it could understand him. The animal responded with a howl and then it leapt at him. Moving with lightning speed and agility, the man rolled out of the way and was back on his feet in a flash. He drew and a loud retort filled the alley, all while the animal was still in midair. The impact of the projectile sent it spiraling down. It hit the ground heavily and it did not move. I stood there transfixed and barely able to breathe. The man opened the trunk of his car, picked the animal up and placed it inside. As he closed the trunk, I could swear that I saw pale human skin appearing beneath the animal's fur. The man turned back to me. Word of advice, stranger. Stay out of dark alleys on nights like these. The full moon's real pretty, but she brings out the beast. And then he tapped the brim of his fedora in a relaxed salute and climbed back into his car. I was left standing watching open-mouthed as he drove away. I hadn't noticed that it was a full moon, but when I looked up, I saw a burning bright in the dark city night. I took a deep breath and I headed back to my car. There were missed calls on my work phone and a red-flagged email telling me to report to personnel in the morning. I didn't tell the drone in the suit who I met in the security company's headquarters at 9.30 the next day what had happened in the alley. I knew that that was pointless. There was no way that he would believe me and, it turned out, the damage was already done. I listened as he told me that I was fired for taking an unauthorized break. It took all my self-control not to reach over the desk, grab him and tell him exactly what I thought of his organization and his stupid face. With my head held high, I walked out onto the street. I had my dignity but nothing else. I was unemployed and close to broke. I needed to think. I decided it was too early to go to the bar and consider my options over a stiff drink. And my cramped apartment was the last place that I wanted to be when I was already feeling down. So I set off walking. I had no destination in mind, I just drifted. As I paced the streets, my mood got bleaker and bleaker. I could not see a way out of the dire situation that I was in. Finally, as dusk fell, I gave in to the temptation of a drink. There was a bar on the corner. It had no windows and there was broken glass and cigarette ends scattered across the sidewalk in front of it. It was a dive. Ideal for a loser like me that I figured and I headed in. The inside of the bar was hazy with smoke and dimly lit by a fluorescent strip that was dancing with flies. There were half a dozen patrons and nursing beers and a jukebox playing a song about looking for love. The only thing anybody was going to find in this place was regret and stale breath. I headed to the bar and ordered a double bourbon neat. The barman slid over a glass and poured out the drink. The rim of the glass had more fingerprints on it than a crime scene, telling myself that alcohol was a very effective disinfectant. I downed the bourbon in one and then turned to leave. Call it the ambience, call it the dirty looks that I was getting because my eyebrows did not meet in the middle, but this bar was not helping my mood one little bit. I was almost back at the door when it swung open and the man from the alley had strolled in. His fedora, long leather coat, and confident strut made him stand out a mile in the seedy bar. He looked at me and I saw recognition in his eyes, but he carried on right by me without a word and made his way towards a lone figure sitting at a corner table. I had paid this man no heed before. He was keeping to the shadows and even as he was approached, he had eyes only for the drink that sat in front of him. 
Common sense was telling me that there was about to be trouble and that I should leave. But I had not ended up one step away from the gutter by listening to my common sense. So I leaned against the wall and watched and waited. The man wearing the fedora had reached the table. He had his back to me, but I imagined a gold tooth glinting as he said, It's time to end this. His voice was calm and cold. He meant business. The lone figure responded by taking a long drink, then placing his glass back down slowly and deliberately. The sound of the glass clinking on the tabletop was the loudest sound on the bar by now. The jukebox was silent and everybody else in there seemed transfixed by the encounter as well. The lone figure got to his feet. He was slender and dressed all in black. In the gloom, his eyes were two points of darkness and his skin looked drained of all color. And then he smiled and I felt a cold chill run through my body. The tips of his teeth were viciously sharp points. Had he filed them down to be like that, I wondered, or was there another explanation? One that belonged far from the light of day in a dank, dark place like this. The lone figure kept smiling as he said, That's not going to happen. It's night now, so I'll be leaving here to get myself a drink that satisfies my thirst. The plasma they keep behind the bar for me here just doesn't cut it. In fact, this whole situation lacks bite. And then he snarled and his jaw snapped open. His grotesque teeth looked like a steel trap. One that was about to close around the neck of the man in the fedora. But once again he moved at speed, producing a sharp wooden stake from inside of his leather coat and striking it into the heart of the lone figure, who screamed and then crumbled into dust. The man in the fedora turned to walk away. Only his path to the door was blocked by the barman. He held a sawed off. You shouldn't have done that, he said. Vampires are my best customers. And then he let loose with both barrels. There was nothing that the man in the fedora could do. He was sent flying backwards, crashing through chairs and tables before sliding to a halt. Appalled at all of this, I threw myself at the barman and knocked him out with the right hook. And then I scrambled over to the man in the fedora. He was in a bad way, but he was still breathing. His eyes flickered open. I forced a reassuring smile onto my face and said, Don't try and move. I'll call 911. No, there will be too many questions. He gasped and tried to sit up. His face contorted with pain and he swore. And then through gritted teeth he said, Help me get out of here. I had no idea what he was talking about and still thought about calling the authorities. It was the best thing to do. But I saw that the other customers were giving us filthy looks and that the barman was coming around. I decided that getting out of there as soon as possible was the wisest option after all. I helped the man in the fedora get to his feet and took as much of his weight as I could as we struggled towards the door and out into the night. I recognized his car parked across from the bar. He gave me the keys and collapsed into the passenger seat. I was about to tell him that I was not insured to drive his vehicle when I saw the door of the bar open and the barman emerge. Getting pulled over for a traffic offense was small change compared to the volley that was about to come our way. So I dived into the car, gunned the engine and gripped the wheel as we sped away. I almost hit a car at the next intersection, but I swerved just in time. My heart was beating way too fast and I was coated in sweat. And then the headlights of a truck filled my line of vision and its horn blasted out a warning. It missed us by inches. I couldn't take it anymore. I pulled up at the side of the road and sat there shaking. I glanced over at the man in the fedora and was amazed to see that he was grinning. What in Hades' name is going on? I snapped. I'm a freelance operative, he replied. I'm paid by the government to eliminate monsters. I looked at him, lost for words. It sounds crazy, I know, he continued. But I assure you that I don't need a straitjacket. Just one more favor. 
I live a couple of blocks from here. I'm figuring it would be safer to walk the rest of the way and while my Kevlar vest soaked up most of the blast, I'm still in a world of pain. He left it hanging there. I sighed and then told him that I would help him get home but that that was it. A day that had started with me being fired had descended into chaos and my nerves were shredded. With him leaning on me, we made our way slowly through the streets until finally we reached what looked to me like a derelict warehouse. Even though it was late, a steady stream of traffic passed by. This city never slept. This is my place, he said, while unlocking the door with a big brass key. The door opened with a creak and I helped him inside. He flicked a light switch on, revealing a long open plan room that was a strange mix of a workshop and a living space. An old and very comfortable looking sofa sat in front of a TV that looked about 30 years old. There was a fridge nearby, a stove and a sink that was piled high with dishes. A toolbox stood open on the floor near to the sink and a wide wooden workbench ran along the side of one wall. There was an unmade bed as well and an empty clothes hanger. Rumpled clothes lay scattered across the floor. I'm guessing you live here alone, I said. He shrugged and responded with, Wherever I lay my stakes, and that's my home. I thought that he was joking until I saw the row of wooden stakes lined up against the wall. The tip of each was sharpened, just like the one he had used in the bar. He tapped the nearest one and said, I like to keep plenty of replacements. I always seem to be leaving things behind. And then he made his way over to the sofa and sunk down onto it. I could see that he was still in a lot of pain, but his breathing was irregular and as I watched his eyelids close, he started to snore quietly. It was time for me to make my exit. Only I could hear the rain falling heavily against the roof of the building. It sounded filthy outside and I was beat. There was an armchair in one corner of the room. It looked ancient and the lining was split open in a bunch of places. But at that moment in time, it also looked incredibly comfortable. I dragged myself over and pretty much collapsed onto it. I don't even remember closing my eyes. The next thing I knew, I was blinking and yawning and rubbing my face. The morning sun was reaching into the room from a skylight and there was a pot of coffee brewing on the stove. There was also a fax machine whirring into life. I thought they had gone the way of the dinosaur, so I was bemused by the spectacle as a printout had appeared. I went over to see what was on the sheet of paper. It was a two-tone reproduction of a mugshot. Whoever it was was not going to win any beauty contests. He looked desperate and dangerous. He also appeared human, but I assumed there was more to him than met the eye, if he was of interest to a monster hunter. Below the picture, there was a dollar sign followed by four figures. I whistled quietly to myself, to a man in my dire financial straits. It was a substantial sum. I was thinking how having that kind of money in my pocket would have made my life a whole lot better when the man who I had helped the night before came into the room. He took the printout from me, studied it, and then said, it Looks like it's time for me to go back to work. His leather coat and fedora were on the floor. He started to bend over to pick them up, but he pulled up in pain. Look, I said, if I understand this right, and you're going to try and take out that desperado for that fee, then I would say that you're going to fail. I reckon at best that you've cracked a couple of ribs. What you need is a partner with a 50-50 split of the money when we succeed. He didn't look happy about my suggestion and replied, It will be dangerous in the extreme. You must realize that after seeing the last couple of vermin that I took out. Unease trickled through me, but I wasn't going to be put off that easily. I really wanted the money. I pointed at the mugshot and I asked, What kind of monster is this? He grabbed a second page that had appeared from the fax machine 
read it, and then told me. It says that he's a shapeshifter. He's more dangerous than the lycanthrope that I killed in the alley because he can change at will, not just during the full moon. And he could well share the cold logic of the vampire from the bar. The amount of the fee reflects this. I swallowed and tried to pretend like I was not scared as I said, My offer to partner up with you still stands. He felt his ribs and then looked me in the eye and growled, Let's do this thing. He drove this time, once in every time that we hit a pothole. I had the two printouts on my lap and I was leaping through an old A to Z of the city. I was looking for the street name that was among the details provided on the second sheet of paper. You do know that it's much easier to do this online. I told him as yet another bump in the road made me lose my page. Easier but risky, he told me. Emails and messaging services are frequently hacked but no one is looking for information sent by fax. And who's to say that somebody isn't looking at the results of your internet searches the moment that you bring them up? I guess you don't trust money being wired into banks either. So how do you get paid? I said with a cynical tone. He replied without missing a beat. In cash, used in notes, collected from drop-off points in never the same place. Do you like being given cash in hand? I know I do. I had to smile, he had me there. I went back to the A to Z. After a couple of unnecessary detours caused by my rusty map reading, we finally turned into the right street. The apartment block that we were looking for was on our left. Finding monsters in alleys and dive bars had made sense. I also assumed monsters would hang out in graveyards, crumbling mansions, and other generally creepy and run-down locations. As I climbed out of the car and looked up, I was surprised. The apartment block was sleek and modern. Balconies extended below each window. The views from the upper ones must have been stunning. And back down at ground level, there was no graffiti or trash anywhere in sight. Are you sure this is the right place? I asked. He looked at me and said, The facts never lies. Then, hiding his pain behind a swagger, he strode up to the entrance and pressed a bunch of intercom buttons all at once. Somebody's bound to be expecting a delivery. He said, and sure enough, we were buzzed in straight away. We made our way through the plush lobby and waited on the elevator. The details that we had been given also told us the shapeshifter lived in the penthouse suite. It must be profitable being a monster, I said as the display showed the elevator descending. The man in the fedora kept his attention on the display as he replied. But for some it can be. They use their differences to gather fortunes and power, sometimes through diluted acolytes. Sometimes through violence and cunning. For others, though, being different is a curse, pure and simple. They wallow in filth, driven by base instincts to feed and hide. Either way, it's only a matter of time before they're identified as monsters and an operative is sent to end them. The elevator arrived and the door slid open. The interior was wallpapered and there was a small ornate sofa on one side. More signs that the shapeshifter had clearly done very well for himself. That was all about to change. The elevator ride was smooth and swift and we emerged into a corridor where our boots sank into a thick white carpet. Out of the corner of my eye I noticed a security camera fixed high on the wall turned to face us. I pointed it out and whispered. Motion activated. The man in the fedora drew and obliterated the camera. Not anymore, he said and walked up to the door leading to the penthouse. It's over, he yelled and then slammed his boot into the door. I noticed for the first time that he had steel toe caps and steel heels. The door cracked and he forced it open and stepped inside. I followed. I could feel the adrenaline pushing my fear away. The downtrodden security guard was history. I was a monster hunter's partner now. The vestibule of the penthouse was larger than any of the rooms in my apartment. There were oil paintings on the wall and light fittings that sparkled like jewels. A door opened up off it. 
The man in the fedora was already barging through it. I hurried after him into a living room with a floor-to-ceiling window. High-rises soared in the distance. A man sat in an antique chair in one corner of the room. I recognized him from the mugshot. He had an arrogant sneer on his face, an arrogance that spread to his voice when he said, Breaking into my home was a mistake. The last one you will ever make. And then he rose to his feet and began to change. His entire body expanded and within seconds he loomed over us. His skin cracked and dark fur began to appear. His fingers split open and claws unfurled and the sneering face that looked down on us was now that of a beast. It growled and with a dizzying speed went for the man in the fedora. He made to draw but his injuries must have slowed him because the shapeshifter reached him before he could. The shapeshifter lashed out with one of its claw-tipped paws and the man in the fedora was sent flying across the room. He lay there looking dazed. His leather coat and Kevlar vest were ripped and blood was seeping out. The shapeshifter raised its claws, ready to inflict a fatal blow. I had to act. I grabbed a chair and swung this at the shapeshifter. It turned and smashed the chair out of my grip. I was left standing there as the shapeshifter snarled at me. The only thing that I had achieved was to move up the victim chain. I would be diced and sliced and left as a mess on the floor. My life flashed before my eyes and I felt sick to the core as I realized what my last thought would be. I have wasted my time on this earth. But then something whipped into sight, a blur of silver. The shapeshifter looked confused then its head toppled to the floor. The man in the fedora dragged himself into view. He was holding a silver boomerang. An excellent weapon, he drawled. Portable with an edge that will cut through most anything and very loyal. It always comes back. The head was already changing back into that of a man. A very dead man. I turned away and was violently sick. By the time that I had recovered, the man in the fedora had left the room. I ran after him and called out. Do we still have a deal? I get half of the fee. He was stepping into the elevator and did not turn around as he replied. Yeah, sure, I'm going to collect it now. I'll meet you later and hand over your share. Be at the alley where we first met at midnight. And don't be late. The door slid closed behind him. I punched the air and said, Yes. I was too wired to head home or go for a drink, so once again, I found myself pacing the streets. I was excited at the prospect of the cash coming my way, but I wanted more than a payoff. I wanted to be back on the trail of a monster. I wanted the rush of the confrontation, the elation of victory. Sure, I was green and I knew there was no way that I could strike out on my own, but the way forward was obvious. I had persuaded the man in the fedora to partner up with me once and I would do that again. I was still telling myself that as I waited for him in the alley. It was five minutes to midnight. And then midnight came and went and there was no sign of him. I told myself not to worry. He would be there soon with my money and I would seize my opportunity to change my life forever. But by 1am I was still alone. I cursed the man in the fedora. Did he think that he could rip me off? Well, there was no way that I was going to let that happen. I set off for his base. It took me hours to get there on foot and I was exhausted but still furious until I saw that his door was hanging open. I knew that someone as security conscious as him would never have left it like that and my anger had dissipated. My nerves tangling with dread, I slipped inside to be met by a shocking sight. The man in the fedora was lying on the floor in a pool of blood. No, I cried out and ran forwards. I knelt next to him and tried to find a pulse, but there was nothing. I began to weep, and as I did so, laughter drifted from the edge of the room. I spun around. A tall, pale figure dressed all in black walked into view. His eyes were pools of darkness. My mind flashed back to the lone figure in the bar. 
the vampire. Was this his kin? You did this. I spat the accusation out. The pale figure smiled. I took my revenge. I was shaking as I screamed at him. You murderer. The pale figure shook his head. No, I did not kill him. Because there are worse things than death that I can inflict. You will see. And then he walked away out into the night. My mind was racing. I needed to do something, but what? I decided that I should take care of the body first. It was an empty shell now, but I still wanted to treat it with respect. I grabbed a towel from among the things on the floor and began to clean away the blood. I stopped when I saw two wounds on the neck. They were small and deep and I knew in my heart what they were. Bite marks. I recalled the vampire's words. There are worse things than death I can inflict. And now when I looked down at the man in the fedora's chest, I could see that it was moving. This was so slight that it was no wonder I had missed it. But there was no question now. He was not dead. He was undead. I knelt there and watched as his chest rose and fell as his eyes opened. I could see the pain in them, the confusion. What happened? He asked, his voice very faint. I told him there was no point in lying, no way back. And he knew that better than me. I can't exist like this, as a monster, he said in a quiet, wary voice. And then he asked me to help him get up. I supported him as he struggled to his feet. He took off his fedora and handed it to me. It was dawn by now and the sun was starting to reach into the room through the skylight. He began to move through the shadows that remained towards the still open door. He hesitated for a moment on the threshold, perhaps remembering his own life, perhaps summoning the courage that he needed, and then he stepped outside. Through the gap, I could see the smoke rising from his exposed skin as the sunlight touched him. I closed my eyes. I couldn't bear to watch. I stayed like that for a long time. After a while, I moved over to the sofa and I collapsed onto it. I felt more alone and lost than I ever had in my whole miserable life. The world was infected by evil. How could I find my place in it now that my eyes had been opened to this? At dusk, I made a decision. There was one thing I could do. One thing that I had to do. Take revenge. The need for this burnt white hot inside me. I put the fedora on, picked up a steak and stepped outside. The rain struck the streets as I stared out into the night. The lights of cars blurred as they passed and sirens rose and fell in their endless serenade. I took a deep breath. Excitement and fear mingled inside me. It was time to go to work.